takes. That should be our desire. Lord, whatever it takes. I apologize this morning. Uh, my dad used to sing that song. <clears throat> I can hear him singing it in heaven this morning. <clears throat> I'm thankful <clears throat> that one day after a while, I'll be able to see him again and tell him, I was willing to do whatever it took to be more like him. I want you to remember, no matter what you're going through in this life, there's nothing worth losing your salvation over. Because one day after a while, when it is all said and done, when you took your last breath or he comes again, what rejoicing there will be when we're able to see him face to face, our Savior and our Lord. Again, thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. And I appreciate just a few moments of me letting me collect myself. But this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I am so thankful for each and every one of you who have came today and worshiped with us. Uh, I've been excited. I tell you, the Lord has been dealing with me so much in my spirit on some of these messages. And I tell you, sometimes I don't feel like I'm coming or I'm going with them. I tell you, it's just been, I feel like the Lord is really just beginning to establish my heart and, and preparing not only me, but I believe that he is preparing the church for his return. And we better be ready. And I got to think about this week, about the promises of God. And I'm probably going to wind up preaching about this a couple of times, but that'll be okay too. But the title of it, or the title of, uh, of my sermon today, is Living in the Promise. And uh, as I began to read it, began to read the word and began to look about the promise that God had given not only Abraham, but uh, as it, his seed and his offspring, it took a long time for them to truly possess the promised land. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 7. And as I read these scriptures, I want you to take, or think, take just a few moments and think about the promised land that Maybe you yourself have failed in your life or you thought was your promised land. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions, and they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem and the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. 
And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards Negev. When you begin to read this promise that God has given Abram or Abraham, I want you to realize a couple of things here. It was a promise that not only would he possess the land, but as you notice, he said, even your offspring will possess this land. Abram was actually walking in the promised land at the time. And as he began to walk into the promised land, the first thing that came was the Canaanites who were uh, very disastrous people. They were very cruel people, mean, corrupt, callous people. And in the midst of that promised land, or in the midst of seeing those, God appeared to Abram and said, This is the land. This is the land that He's giving not only him but his offspring. And I can only imagine as God appeared to Abram, he set up an altar and he built an altar, an altar of praise that even in the midst of those who occupied the land, he knew truly that God had given him the promise. Today, I don't know what promise God has given you. I don't know the things in your life that Maybe you feel as though God has promised you that God would help you, your family or uh, job or opportunity that you feel has, uh, uh, has promised for you. But I can tell you that just because we reach the promised land doesn't mean it's all over. In fact, when we read the, the word, we can realize that uh, it's the promised land where we find a few things uh, that weren't expected. It wasn't expected that he would find the Canaanites there. But God appeared to him in the midst of it. And just because today we feel like we've entered into our promised land doesn't mean that there is not work to be done. I believe with all my heart God is showing us when we and all the things that we have been blessed with in our lives. I, I can remember as a, as a young teenager, and 13, 14 year old, my promised land was to turn 16. For I was promised when I turned 16, I could take a test and I can receive my license to drive. My promised land at that moment was independence, right? When you turn 16, that's the thing you think about. Or 15, you say, I get a permit. I'm promised a permit to train myself to drive for when I turn 16 so I can drive on the roads alone. There's a story, and I'll not tell most of it, but I had a sister who had took a test back then. You could just take a quick test, and after the test showed that you passed it, my mom puts my sister in a straight shift manual truck and me, my mom, and my sister was in a little Chevy S10 about to embark on a journey of a lifetime. <laughs> my sister is just a year older than I was and she gets in and begins to sputter and stall and she gets going and doing pretty well and it was mainly four lane all the way almost homed and it at the end it come down into a two lane and a car had pulled out and my mama had said now do you see that car and there was no response but she began to say now put the put your uh, foot on the clutch and push your clutch in she did that and then she'd say you got to stop there was no response we get a little closer she said you got to stop we got a little closer. Warning became yelling. She said, stop. And then before we know it, her foot went on the brake mama's and her hand went up in the air and she was calling on the name of the Lord. And I had my eyes closed saying, Lord, if I ever get out of this, I'll never get in the car with her again. Her promised land was passing the test, but yet there was still work to be done. I can remember graduating, the promised land of graduating. I can remember thinking to myself, man, once I graduate, I can do what I want to, when I want to, and how I want to, right? Man, I tell you what, you're talking about liberty. If I can just reach the promised land of graduation. It was a momentous occasion in my life because simply 
I didn't know if I was going to graduate till actually the day we graduated. I barely made it through, but I was glad. My, my family was hooping and hollering, and I tell you what, they was just cheering me on, but I made it. I made it to the promised land. But in that promised land, I realized this boy had to get a job. Then there was another promised land. Once I got settled a little more and realized that there was work to be done in the promised land I just came into, I seen another promised land of courtship and a family. Man, if I just get married, find a, a good woman and get married, man, that's the promised land. I'll be there. I've made it to the cusp promised land I found a beautiful wife everybody gets the privilege of seeing her I get the privilege of seeing her every day I love her we got married I thought that was it man I can just relax and just go to work and do my nine to five come home and 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 a meal would be prepared on the table and I could sit down and we would discuss the days and we would after we would eat we would clean the kitchen together right we would go in there and turn on Mayberry and watch a couple of episodes to retire to our bedroom and go through a devotional and pray and and we would just simply just fall asleep in bliss and in the glory and the presence of God that was my promised land. That's what I thought was going to happen. Yeah, go ahead. You can laugh. But all of you thought the same. Come on. But what we realized, there was still work to be done. I can remember the promised land of children. Now, my wife, that was more her promised land than mine. You know, all of us men, we, we try to work things and we try to have solutions and we try to prepare and we try to get things in order for things like that. But paradise came quickly for us a year and a half into marriage. We had a son. And I tell you, I was very honored this morning for him to be able to do the devotion for our men's ministry. But it was a promised land of children. It was a promised land of, uh, of the joys of raising your very own children. We have got into that promised land and we realized, man, this is not such a great promised land after all sometimes. You get frustrated with them because they act just like you, right? Right? They learn from the best. They learn from us. So when we try to correct them, it's hard to correct them because we know they would do exactly what we would have done at their age. But oh, what a blessing they are. But see, in every aspect, for every promised land, for every promise that is given to us, it's just not something we walk into and it's just the end of everything. It's just a place of rest. It's just a place we can go to and feel comfortable and, and just be happy and nothing else happens. What we find here is that even though God appeared to Abram and he made an offering, an offering of praise because he knew the promise that God has given him, Abraham or Abram continued to walk. And he walked in the place of Bethel and I, or Ai, or however you want to pronounce it. And he's put an altar in between Bethel, which means the house of God, and Ai, which means a heap of ruins. And he put an altar right in the middle of it. And it was an altar of prayer that he placed in between the house of God and the heap of ruins. See, we're at that place in our lives today. The promises that we have. We have the promise of God, one that He would never leave us nor forsake us. 
But it doesn't mean that we're not going to go through some hard times. It doesn't mean that we're going to face some obstacles in our lives. It doesn't mean that things are not going to get hard and that things are going to get, uh, not get difficult. But it simply means that God's promised to be with us regardless of what we have to deal with in this life. See, we think the promise is the houses, is the family, is the uh, success. But no, the promise is that if we live a holy and pleasing life towards God, that when our life is over as we are pilgrims passing through, that we have the blessed promise that when we shut our eyes and take our last breath, when we look again, that we will see our Savior face to face. I don't know about you, the promises that I have walked to in, in my life, in ministry alone. I tell you, there was a promise. I can remember waking up in a dream even before I became your pastor. It was in 20, uh, uh, 2019. I don't even think the events have even occurred, but I, I had a dream, and I dreamed that I was in this establishment. And it was busyness that were going around and there was a lot of things that were happening and I, my whole family was there and I was uh, actually in the family life building and we was talking about carpet and different things and, 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 and I just noticed of all of the goodness that was happening and I felt it in my heart and I can remember the dream so vividly and I woke up and I was excited because I felt like uh, something was about to take place. I knew exactly where it was, but I didn't know any of God's timing. I didn't know any of that, but I just knew that God was in it, and there was a promise that God was giving me. And I could think about how excited I was, and one day that we was in, uh, in our home, and I was making some coffee, and I was telling Tara about the dream, and how God had just, it was so vivid, and it was so, uh, uh, so wonderful. As you can see, you can see some of this new carpet and things like this that's already taken place. But one thing that I stopped as I was telling her, as I began to tell her about all of our family was there. All of our family was there. I stopped for a moment and I looked at her and I said, but one person I didn't see was my dad. And I told God, if this is my promised land, and it causes me losing my father. Lord, I don't know if I'm willing to do that. I'm just being transparent with you today. And I said, God, that's my father. But I've seen everybody in my whole family but my dad. And I bargained with God. I said, Lord, please. And I knew in my spirit exactly what was about to take place. Nevertheless, in February of 2020, my dad passed away. My heart was grieving, but I knew exactly where he was. And then as we roll on into 2020, God blessed us to become your pastors. The promised land looks great from the outside. But I'm here to tell you, when you get in that promised land, there's still work that has to be done. There's people that walk into their promised land who are crushed who are barely able to breathe spiritually, who are going through traumatic times in their life, we must understand that even though we call it our promised land, there is times where we still can feel defeated. You look in Genesis chapter 12 and you go down to, to around verse 11, you see where uh, there was a great famine that was in the land. In the promised land, there was a famine. And it drove Abraham and Sarah Egypt they go into Egypt and you see that in Egypt he told her he said Sarah if these men find out that you're my wife they're going to kill me so I want you to tell them that you're my sister and I'll tell them you are my sister. He was only telling a half truth back there. She was actually his half sister. 
But how many te- can I, how many knows today that a half true is a whole lie? But Abraham, without consulting God, started manipulating the process. I want you to understand, in the middle of the Canaanites, and the meanness of who they were, God himself appeared towards Abram, and Abram made an altar, an altar of praise, because he says, regardless of what surrounded me, I feel the presence of God, and I understand his promises to me, and he builds an altar of praise. I'm telling you, there's a reason why you build an altar to make us understand and for us to remember that praise is always essential in our lives. Even in the promised land, praise is essential. Then as he goes on in between Bethel and Ai, as they look in between, he makes another altar, an altar of prayer. But when he tarries on and continues on, he finds famine and he moves further north and he begins to manipulate the process on his own. And we all know this story very well where Pharaoh had brought her in, gave him cattle and all type of stuff. But God in that story protected Sarah, He protected her. Pharaoh found out exactly what Abram had done. They got all of his belongings. They kicked him out. So Abram and Sarah and all that they have go back to an altar. They go back to the altar that was between Bethel and Ai. They went back to the altar I want you to understand something today. We get so comfortable in our promised land. We get so comfortable when we achieved all the goals that we have set before us. We get so comfortable when we when we go into the, every aspect of life and our routine is down and, and there's nothing that complicated or complicates us at the moment and, and we're happy and we feel like that we can be free and do what we want to and have no, no not many or much responsibility, but we can just uh, stay where we are and bask where we are. But there's a danger there. Just like he walked into this promised land. But in this promised land, in the middle of this promised land was a famine. Today some of us are living in a famine in our promised land. Some of us today have got all the things together, but we stopped praying. We stopped seeking. We stopped crying out and calling out to God. We stop going to our altar of praise and to our altar of uh, prayer and we've just started living life on autopilot. We've started uh, being uh, just happy where we are, content, not wanting to, 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 to really disturb the apple cart, but just go along life and just be happy and just, uh, just let things be like they are. But as I was reminded this morning, there are people who are lost and who are dying who are going to hell. While we're in our promised land, while we're comfortable in our homes and with all that we have and in our jobs and our circumstances, we don't realize that in a split moment we can lose our homes, we can lose our jobs, we can lose our security. But one thing remains the same, that if we put God first and we have God first in our life, it doesn't matter about the circumstance that surrounds us. Uh, It's not a job that sustains us. It is God. It is not a home that makes us complete, but yet it is God who lives inside of us and makes his home inside of our heart. I tell you, the promised land is at reach, uh, and some of us uh, uh, are in that promised land, but we have to understand today... uh, that we still got to seek after him and that there's still work to do. Life gets threatening. Things change. People go searching. The reason why Abram left the promised land was because there was a famine. 
I want you to understand today it's famines when we think we've got everything that we desire and everything that we want that we quit doing the essentials of living a Christian life we're happy with coming to church and checking it off our box and going about our week doing as we please and what we want to do we find ourselves walking out of Canaan and then to Egypt. We see so many times in our lives men and women of God who have been on fire, who God greatly anoints and how God has blessed them and has helped them. They have turned and they have found famine in their promised land and has walked walk to Egypt Egypt being and represents the world how many times have we talked about good men and women who were on fire for God and now we don't even know where they are because they were in a famine in their promised land they thought they had just enough to get by They were unwilling to stay at an altar of praise and an altar of prayer. See, our promised land comes in many different forms. God has probably promised you your family and, and promised you your friends or, or promised you circumstances to take place. But the reality is we still have to reach towards Him. We still have to build our altars. We still have to pray and seek after Him because we understand that regardless of what this world does or regardless of how this world turns out, the only assurity as a believer in Jesus Christ is to know that our hearts are pure and right with God for His day of return when He comes, that we will be called up to meet. That's the most important thing in life. All of this other stuff is just trivial. There's so many people who flee to Egypt because they have lost their connection with God. But you hear a cry here in Psalms 86 as the musicians come. When we find ourselves in a famine, when we find ourselves going through difficult tasks, there are ways that we can respond. We can deny our problems, we can deny that things are happening, and we can continue to walk as we are, to find ourselves afraid empty we can flee to Egypt or go to the world and try to escape through many pleasures that this world offers just one night of escape with alcohol quickly leads to alcoholism and escape just to get away and do what you want to do leads to a life of immorality so you can choose to do those things today you can choose to ignore the famine or you can run to the world or you can build an altar see Abraham went back to Bethel in between Bethel and Ai with all the intentations of the world that's where we are today between God and the world. He goes back to the altar. 
And in Psalms 86, verse 1, I want you to listen to these words. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good, forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're in a famine. I don't know what you're dealing with in your personal lives. One thing I do know, and I know from experience, that even in those promised times, those times where you feel like you're walking in the goodness and the favor of God and you feel like God has opened a door for you and you're walking through those doors, there's a responsibility of the doors that you walk through that you strengthen your relationship with God. The reason why people get so frustrated is because God opens doors for them and they want to enter into those doors doing the same old thing. But can I tell you, when you walk through a door, there's a new expectation that comes upon your life. There's a greater responsibility cast upon you that's going to take a greater anointing it's going to take a greater relationship with God. So the choice, you can continue to walk towards Egypt and out of your promise, or you can simply build an altar. Let us stand this morning. Very quickly, I'm reminded several occasions uh, as a boy up into teenagers, even into my adulthood. We ask somebody to do something for us, and we're really worried if they're going to do it or not. And we say, You promise? You promise? And most of the time, you won't relent. Until you hear the words, I promise. But can I tell you, a promise is only as good as the character of the one who's given the promise. There's been times that someone has promised me, but I just knew that they was going to fail anyway. You've been there, I'm sure. But you held out hope that they could come through the time that you needed. But the promise of God and who He is and the character that He has. When God promises you something, it will come to pass. How long it takes, a lot of times, is determined on you. And we'll learn about that next week. My friend today, 
We find that the fresh promise that God has given Abram here is going to go through time for hundreds and hundreds of years before they're able as the children of God to possess the land. Don't wait all your life because you've been playing 